Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Mornings with Mayish. It's Yvonne here, and thank you so much for joining us. I am going to be here today with celebrity florist and host of the Big Flower Fight, Kristen Griffith Vanderyacht. So, so excited to have this amazing host on. I'm actually a little bit nervous for today, and we'll get into that very soon. Um, but I think it's going to be a really amazing show, guys. Um, I see so many of you guys here already. Thank you so much. Keep on saying good morning. Let us know where you are from. Um, I see Kristen disappeared. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties today. Um, so hopefully he'll be joining here shortly again. He'll be in my green room. Um, also, just before we get started, I want to just remind you guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comments. If we have time, we will cover them. Today is going to be a packed show. I have a lot of questions for Kristen. We have a lot of things that are happening in America that we definitely want to address. Um, and Kristen wanted to talk about it too. So, you know, I'm very excited to have this platform um, and to be able to have those conversations. And then of course we will segue over to the big flower fight and get as many of those questions in as well. Um, so many of people here. Hi guys. Um, also wanted to let you know that our replay will be available over on the blog uh, in the next day or so. We put the video replay, podcast replay, and our show notes up there for you all. So uh, if you miss it or if you, for some reason, have to leave early, and I know I received some message or messages already from some really amazing people saying, I want to watch, but I have a meeting or I have something else going on, and that's okay. So as soon as we are done, Facebook puts the replay up, um, the unedited version, and that will be available, I think, just a few minutes after we end the live show. So all is well and good. I also wanted to make sure that you guys just, I know everyone's busy. There's so many things going on um, in the world with business. Um, but if you want to stay up to date with what's going on and all my interviews, um, any kind of news, that type of thing, be sure to subscribe. And with that, because we have such a busy show and we started a few minutes late, I am going to bring Kristen on. We're gonna get started, all right guys? Hey, Kristen, how are you? Hello. Hi, I'm well. Uh, you know, I think that considering what's happening in the world right now, I think that, you know, I'm doing well, as well as can be, as all of us are. Awesome. I know. Exactly. I know. It's It's been crazy. I know a lot of people mentally are having a tough time. I think just with everything that's going on in the world, you know, everything I feel like that has been continuing to happen and then we get hit with COVID and then, you know, more things happen and it's just one thing after another. So it's definitely been difficult for so many people and I'm just really happy to have you on the show. Yeah. We got to talk a little bit yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't know each other very, very well, but I definitely, but, we, we? but we're changing that today. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that's I, my goal. I think there's also this sort of collective energy that all florists and people who work in the event world uh, share. And so it's, you know, once you pick up a flower, you're part of the brotherhood, or as I like to call it, the sisterhood. The sisterhood. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I love it. So I know a lot of people got to know you a little bit through the big flower fight. But for those of you who may not know Kristen, Kristen, can you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your flower story before we get into the meat of our discussion. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm oh, we lost Kristen again. Let's see. Sorry, guys. Hopefully he'll be back on. Um, so I'm going to say good morning to you guys. Who, who's all here? Oh, I don't have to. Let's see. Ha. Hi. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Oh, technology. You know what I'm gonna do? I've got a plug behind me. I'm gonna plug in this uh, phone because clearly it's trying to be treacherous on us. 
No problem. Yes. Technology sometimes is our friend and sometimes it is not. That is for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're all at home. So these are COVID times. It is COVID time. Yes. I hope that helps. If it cuts me off again, I'll just call you back. It's it's all good. And and we have more people joining me. So oh, I, our, my email went this. out. Yeah, so we're we're good. Okay, good. Let me just like fix this so you can't see the margins. All right. Um yeah, so for everyone I guess who's joining us, uh, I'm Kristen Griffith Andriad. I'm the head judge on the big flower fight. And I got my start in flowers in two thousand and eleven. And I just really started doing flowers for my husband. Um, At the time, he was my boyfriend. And we were living in Brooklyn, New York. And anyone who's ever been to New York, there are flowers everywhere. Uh, Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, we're really lucky there. And Mm -hmm. so that's how I started. I started playing. And I was going to grad school at the exact same time at Columbia for counseling psychology. And I had this very uh, sort of stark um, comparison between the two professions, right? And in 2013, I just knew, I was like, this is not the gig. This is not it, okay? This is not (laughs) the gig for me. Um, Mostly because I would be in my work study sessions and I would be thinking about flowers, And I was like, oh my gosh, these clients deserve a therapist who uh, is focused on them and not about when peony season is going to happen. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, and and I thought it was the best decision I could have made for myself. Um, And that's when I actually like dove head in and started my business out in New York City. Amazing. So you said you did flowers for your husband. Like in my house, like for me. In your house, okay. It started out, it started out with me just getting flowers and like being excited about them. And then uh, he, Aaron at the time would be like, ooh. And I'd be like, yes, ooh, yes. And so from there, I sort of developed my own taste and wanted to learn more. And um, I started interning at floral shops in New York City, working for other event florists out there, and just really trying to educate myself as much as possible. Because I, the one thing that I knew was that I was not going back to school. I, right. I was like, uh, I just paid that Columbia tuition. There's no way. So I was like, I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. I'm going to have to yeah. figure out how to do these flowers by myself and go a more non-traditional Root. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, school's not for everyone, and, and yeah. I think that's an important story there too. So you started in New York City, and then you're on the other coast now. Yes. Yes. So I'm in Washington State. I'm in Washington State. We moved out here in 2016 um, to have kids because we knew that we always wanted to have kids. But I was like, uh, really, me on a subway in New York City. <laughs> with what, like five or six screaming children and a handful of Whole Foods bags? Uh-uh, I need a car. We got to move. <laughs> <laughs> so so we got out of the city and moved out to the West Coast. And I'm so happy we did. And then I also rebranded uh, my business at that time. I started okay. out as Full Aperture Floral in New York City. And then I rebranded to Wild Bloomin' when we moved out here. Great. Yeah. Okay. I love that story. It's so interesting how everyone has a different story of how they became a florist. And it's, yeah. it's, and it takes them on just these wild routes to get to where they, where they are and where they find happiness. So. Yeah. And I, I think that's actually part of um, the beauty of a creative profession is right. that you have an opportunity to find your voice. And that I think is the most important element of any sort of creative profession is finding your voice, finding out what you want to communicate through whatever medium you're working on. And so, yeah, 
I was able to find my voice. I still think I'm finding my taste and my sort of uh, style continues to evolve and to change. And I think you have to be just very forgiving uh, of your old work and forgiving of the work that you're going to be doing in the future because it's always yes. a change. Yes. Know? Yeah. I love that. That's my favorite part of life, honestly. I feel like it'd be very boring if you weren't evolving and changing and growing. Yeah. Um, it would, yeah, we wouldn't want to do what you're doing for 10 <laughs> plus years, 20 years, some of us 30, 40 years. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not there yet, guys. I'm not that old. But, you know, <laughs> cheers to all of you guys that have been doing this for such a long time. I love yeah, it. Exactly. And there are so many people in the industry who have been doing it for so long who I'm yes. like, tell me, tell me your secrets. Exactly. Everything. Yeah. Because there's so much knowledge out there. There really is. And th and that's why I love this platform. Yeah, it's great. All right. So I I wanted to start off by just letting everyone know that I did reach out to Kristen uh, yesterday about doing the show as planned and whether or not we should move the date just because I honestly wasn't sure what to do. We definitely couldn't do today without addressing the current events that are happening. And Kristen, I loved your response because you said, I think it is important to continue to highlight the power of creativity as a pathway to healing during times of social unrest. Yes. So I, I love that message. I'm getting goosebumps just reading it. <laughs> um, and then afterwards I called you because you know, while I'm humbled and I'm honored to be able to have, provide a platform to have this conversation, I'm honestly just really nervous because I've never done anything like this before. I talk about flowers and design and business and marketing, but never about issues on race. Um, so I just wanted to hand it over to you and just how do you want to start this part of the conversation off? Um, well, I think I think that the, there are a few points that I want to make. Um, the first is everyone's journey because that's what we're all on right now mm -hmm. i believe that there's been an awakening um in our country and around the world um everyone's journey is going to be very different it's going to be an individual process that you have to sort of go on and surrender to that you know bus ride <laughs> surrender right. to that journey and that is the opposite of how we as humans want to operate we want to be in control of our destiny we want to be in control of our environment and we want to pretty much control everything because that's what makes us feel safe so part of what is happening is a lot of people are feeling subconsciously unsafe they're feeling unsafe because it is unfamiliar Right. And so all mm -hmm. of the sensors in our bodies are telling us they're making us feel anxious. They're making us feel nervous, like you mentioned. But yeah. there are two kinds of anxiety. Right. There's the anxiety that says, oh, OK, girl, the building's on fire. Get out. And then there's the anxiety that says, OK, this is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm unfamiliar, but I'm not in danger. Right. And I think that is what we need to be leaning into right now. These conversations are going to be so uncomfortable. And it's that discomfort that helps us to remember in the future when these sorts of um, these issues come up again that says, OK, you know what? I've been here before and I'm not doing this again. So therefore, I'm changing. And that's what... Um, I think is really important about this bigger movement that's happening in the world. And then on a more individualized uh, message, I think it's really important to remain creative because all of this sort of, this awakening, this journey that we're on is exhausting, right? We're in the middle of a molting process. We are molting our old selves and we are emerging new and we are emerging more awake and we are just elevating really our consciousness as an entire group of people. Yes. And, and in order to do that, you need to give your brain space, right? Like if you're working on a muscle, you need to have a rest period. And I believe that giving yourself time to be creative. And I'm talking on all levels. I'm not just talking on like 
the floral design level. I'm talking about like the most basic thing. If your creative joy is making a picket sign to take to a protest, do that, right? Get all the glitter, get all the stickers, get all the Sharpies, like do, do what makes you happy. And what happens is, is when we're creative, we've, it's like opening a window to our brain, right? I think every single florist out there can relate to it is you start working on arrangement or bouquet or whatever it is, a piece and three hours have gone by and you're like, but I just started. And it's because our brains have gone into a place where and I, I, I don't, I'm not a scientist, so don't ask me. <laughs> I, I think that our brains have gone into a place that allows us to really like um, work harmoniously within the time that we're given. And we are just like able to think and process things more clearly. So giving ourselves that, you know, creative space allows you to actually uh, process everything that's happening around you, right? It's almost like when you're washing dishes, right? Right. You might have some of your biggest aha moments, your biggest like ideas for your business or your life or whatever. Um, the clarity comes when you're actually not thinking directly about the thing. Uh, and that's why it's so important to remain creative uh, because we need to be well rested too for the work that we have to do right now. I love it. And that really kind of talks to self care. I know I've seen uh -huh. a lot of people talk about that. And um, if you guys haven't watched Kristen's video that he posted, I believe yesterday, he he goes on to talk more about that and, and even just like all the different examples. And I, I just think it's really powerful. Yeah. I think that's a, a wonderful and beautiful message to be putting out into the world right now. Yeah, especially now. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, it just came to me, honestly, like I, that wasn't planned. I was, I actually think that I was cleaning up. Um, and I've been doing a lot of cleaning in my house <laughs> yeah. recently. I mean, before COVID, sure, I was like super clean, but now it's like, clean up this mess. <laughs> um, and, and I'm the one who's doing it. And I right. do it because in the same way of being creative, it gives me the space to sort of like, just like clear the deck and think about what the next steps are going to be. And it's very grounding. And that is sort of my form of self-care, even if it's, you know, in the middle of the day. I think I clean probably five times a day. I don't know. It's like, yeah. Yeah. You go. <laughs> I, I need I need to be able to do that. I, I don't have any time. <laughs> I know. You think we'd have more time because we're stuck at home, but we don't. No, no, not at all. <laughs> um. Okay, so... Back on topic, I, I see a lot of words being used like diversity and inclusivity, and, and, and this has been part of the conversation for a while um, within our industry. And I actually had a, a viewer send in a question, and she said, what do you feel and think about how Pinterest, Pinterest is very white-centric, and so are the news feeds and so many in the floral industry? How can we include more diversity and take part in breaking down the long-term impacts of social injustice and systematic racism? Um, and so my question kind of on top of that is, what does that mean to you being diverse and inclus inclusive? Um, and what are some tangible ways that we can work towards being better in those areas? Uh, well, uh Platforms like Pinterest and yeah. Instagram, Facebook, I even think, I think those are the three that I can think of off the top of my head. But all of those platforms work on an algorithm, right? They mm -hmm. show you what is popular, what is trending, because the way that they value the success of their platform is about the investment of time that an individual puts in. So their yes. goal is not to let you leave the platform. They want you to stay on. They want you to keep scrolling. They want you to keep pinning. They want you to keep commenting, right? So they're going to be pushing uh, content forward that is more popular. And by nature, I think that we have been just programmed from the messages. And I'll talk from a personal level. Growing up, I never saw, you know, a lot of people of color, black people it portrayed in a glamorous 
light, right? There's Mm -hmm. Hollywood and then there's TV, but I never saw it in like a common way, like an ad at JCPenney, right? Or for you young folks, you probably don't know what JCPenney is, but (laughs) 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 right? So uh, I never saw it. So we were subconsciously given the messages that like, brown skin, black skin just wasn't even part of the conversation of what is glamorous, beautiful, expensive, luxurious. So I think the solution to that is you have to actively seek it out on the platforms. Go on your Pinterest and pin it, pin, look it out there. Because I actually do find it. I'll type in, you know, black model floral dress, uh, you know, if I'm building an inspiration board. And I think you have to start, we all need to start um, changing the algorithm, changing the way that the algorithm responds to diversity and people of color. So I would say actively search that stuff out um, because it's not going to be fed to you. It's not going to be in your immediate feed. You're going to have to look for it. Uh, And second is start creating content start creating content. Something that happens in the floral industry is we love a styled shoot. We yes, love we a do. styled shoot. We mm-hmm. love the opportunity to play with flowers and take some pictures with a photographer and you get your little cake friend and you get your, your dress friend and you get your model friend together and you put together a shoot and next thing you know, it's on, you know, style me pretty, right? Start doing shoots with more diverse people. We have to make the content ourselves because the corporations, the big corporations that are putting out there, putting all that work out there, you're not going to see it unless it starts with us, right? In the same way that you have a grassroots movement in law reform, um, we need to also have our, you know, our seed movement in the floral world, right? Where we are starting to craft our own narrative of how we believe this industry uh, can operate and the representation that we know, because you all have clients and we all have friends and we all know someone who is talented and all it takes is just giving them a break. Um, I am a product of people giving me a break um, and believing in me. The first, I'll just keep going on a tangent for a second. Yeah, the you go. First, the very first time I had my work published in a magazine, it was New York Magazine. It was 2000 and ooh, maybe 13, maybe 14. Ooh, don't ask me. Um, it was back. <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, it was because I walked into the room. I was late. I was late to the photo shoot. I was late because I was taking, I was living in New York City. I took the uh, the end train, I think it was at the time. I think it was still running. And I was late. And I walked into the shoot with two bouquets. And they had already started. And the photographer looked over and was like, you, those, those are gorgeous. Come over here. Bring them in here. And they ended up, I got a two-page spread in New York Magazine. And this was maybe my first or second year in the business. And I got to stay on set and work with them. And it was just like, it was the most incredible experience. And that was because someone, instead of saying, you're late, get out, unprofessional, they gave me a break. They said, come on in, you have a seat at the table. And I think that is so important in this industry and in uplifting everybody else is give somebody a break. Go on someone's page who only has 500 followers on Instagram, but does fierce work and call them up and be like, hey, girl, come over. Let's take some pictures of your flowers. Um, just, Just give each other an opportunity. And that is how it starts, really. Yeah. I know I want to do a better job of showcasing more diverse designers, um, people of color, black, brown, whoever. So, yeah. you know, just tag us in it. And because and, honestly, I'm, I, I don't want to use the excuse of I'm busy, but I'm a one woman team yeah. managing the whole entire I company. We all are. So, yeah, we're all, we all are. One woman, um, one, woman one man, one man. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, and we follow, you know, I only follow 4,000 accounts, but you yeah. know, it's a lot to scroll through. So just tag me yeah. and, and I want to share. And also I want to share events, different things. If there's a webinar that you're hosting, I will, I will share. I want to be able to, I love sharing just in general. So, you know, I would love to just know about those things. So if you right. let me know, I will, I will do my best to definitely right. share it. For sure. Um, but I think that was a, a great, a great answer to that question, Kristen. Thank you. Sure. Got to share, put more out add, there. I would Create also the content. Like just add real quickly um, that it's not charity, right? I think that there's a misconception that happens between uplifting another person, giving another person their, their big break, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Versus charity, right? Because the thing is, is a lot of people probably have their own baggage and their own insecurities about not wanting to be accused of pity, right? Because the, the fear is that we say, hey, you don't, I don't know you. I think you're great. I would love to work with you. And the fear is that the person's going to turn around and be like, I don't need your pity. I don't need right. your help. I can do this on my own. I, you know, I'm a self-made person, right? And... I don't think that in my experience of, you know, working in this industry, I've ever extended a hand and had it slapped back. So allow yourself to be vulnerable and make that leap and make those connections and take a risk and, you know, start small. If you're like, Ooh, you have feelings, you're feeling tingly, start small, start with just like, you know, coming over and, coffee and inviting them into your space and getting to know them. I think the biggest thing right now is outreach and connecting and, right. and bridging the gaps. Yeah. Very good. So on your OprahMag.com interview, <laughs> fancy schmancy, <laughs> you know, now I, you're on can I tell you old <laughs> mornings with Mayish. <laughs> I think it's all valuable. But when that Oprah magazine called me, I boohooed like somebody stole my cat. I was like, I couldn't believe it. I'm still in shock, honestly. <laughs> it's amazing. I was reading that and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe you said, yeah, I'll be on your show. Whatever, you oh, know? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Come on. You can't forget where you came from. My little, my little show. Okay, so <laughs> you spoke about representing Black excellence. Yeah. And on the show, uh, in, but in your everyday life as well. Can you expand on that? Because I, I love, I love that. And I'm, I know in interviews, especially when it's written in a magazine, things kind of get chopped away. So I want to just let you riff on that black excellence on the show, but also in your everyday life. Well, I think that what I was referring to is I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family that really valued uh, the contributions that African Americans made to their community. And that's really what it refers to. It refers to getting involved in your community to make a positive change. And therefore you are an example. So even if it is something as small as you are working at your kid's school, you're volunteering at your kid's school every now and then, and you're going in and you're helping out in the classroom, or you're helping build a set for school plays, which don't get me started on the importance of theater programs, because I could talk for hours, and I'm going to circle back. But uh, I think just getting involved in your community and showing up, showing up and in your presence, showing up in your involvement, showing up in your opinions, showing up the umbrella of that, I think is super important. And therefore people are able to see you, right? Because if we're talking about visibility and diversity, that means we need to also get involved. Um, and so for me, I like to believe that my black excellence, <laughs> um, the opportunity that, th that is there for me is to use my platform right now, the show. And even before the show, I've just been given the gift of having people who 
find me interesting, which I still don't know why, but I, I find, I want to use that to not just talk about flowers, but I mean, if you've been following for a while, you know, I get political. I get political on my Instagram, uh, you know, when I had Facebook, I deleted Facebook. Uh, when I had Facebook, I was <laughs> very political on there. On Twitter, I'm very political. Um, just because I think that, you know, if there's something going on in the world, it's a duty to talk about it. And if you're upset and you see someone hurting, then it's our duty to take care of each other. And so that's what I mean by Black excellence is being part of your community. I love it. All right, so during our phone conversation yesterday, you mentioned finding joy and looking for reasons to celebrate, which brings us to the big flower fight. Yeah. And, and your critical role as a judge, <laughs> amazing. My my little ones yeah. wanted to come, my, my big one came and said hello. My little one She's gets so more good. shy when she knows the cameras are on and things like that. So, um, and I like threaten their lives if they walk in my in my office while we're doing these things. Um, but yeah, they love you. Uh, everyone loved you. So, and it was such a, being a judge on something like this is so important. And so can you tell us a little bit about that and how you were selected to be the judge on a Netflix show? Yeah. So I'll talk about how I uh, was cast in the show. <laughs> is that your dog? Yes, that's Remington. Mm -hmm. I love it. You know, I have a miniature schnauzer, uh, Marshall, who he barks so much. And it's just like, you know, this is real life. This it is. is. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, please. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. We all have a, a little creature in our lives, whether it's a child or an animal. That makes oh, no yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, they reached out to me on Instagram, right? They slid into my DMs. It was, like, so crazy. Um, I was driving my son to daycare, and I saw a little, like, message pop up because, ugh, like an idiot, I still have no had notifications like popping up on my phone, which I turned <laughs> off. Yes. By the way. Um, and so I saw it. And I think in this like the little message I saw, it was like, blah, 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 TV show, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, me thirsty for attention. I pull over. <laughs> and... <laughs> I pull into a Starbucks parking lot and I respond. And then I'm she's like oh can I can I call you and I'm like oh, okay and I get this you know this number from I don't even know uh, four plus four four I'm like oh gosh where's this person calling from pick up the phone English accent I'm like oh my god where are you she's like I'm in London and I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> and so I talked to her for maybe five minutes maybe five minutes and she's like can I put you on tape? Can I call you and put you on tape? And I'm like, okay, let me, you know, I have a child in the back. Let me go drop him off at daycare and I'll call you back. And, uh, or like, let's call each other back in like 10 minutes. And uh, she calls me back and I'm back in that same Star Starbucks parking lot because I got that good Wi-Fi. Right. And, <laughs> and I'm there and I talked to her for, 10 minutes and she wants to know about my life and you know what kind of judge I would be meanwhile I still don't even know what this is that I'm auditioning for because they're very vague they don't want to tell you anything yeah everything's and hush I, hush everything's so hush hush and so uh I talked to her for maybe 10 minutes she was like great thank you have a nice life and <laughs> I was like okay um that that was weird and then I just went about my life I went about my day and two weeks later I got a phone call uh I think I had an email that was like hey uh the producers of the show want to talk to you and then they offered me the role and told me what it was and like that's where my head exploded it was like <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what it was and I actually think that's a better way for me to operate it's so much mm -hmm. better if I'm the more ignorant I am about a big opportunity the better 
because I think that I think we can all relate to this when you know, oh my gosh, it's it's a huge client. <laughs> you get nervous and you want to start telling them what you think they want to hear. And right. it, it interferes with your ability to be yourself. And we have to remind ourselves that there's no one else like us. There's only one Kristen. There's only one Yvonne. There's only one fill in the blank, right? Whoever you are. And that's what makes you special. So, you know, I gave just an opportunity to be myself and really, um, not censor myself. I didn't let, you know, sort of my like inner hater <laughs> get in the way of my own, you know, potential. And, and that's what I actually try to do on the show too, is I really try to help the teams to allow their creativity to be the star and to be what like guides them while also trying to help them with their taste. As right, well. right. As sometimes well. they listen, sometimes they did not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, can I ask real quick, because yeah. you are so well-spoken, is this something that you, obviously, that I'm sure that's what attracted Netflix to you, is because you're just, you can just talk, and, and very smoothly, and eloquently. How did that happen in your life? Pointers um, for me, please. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> You know, I don't exactly know. First of all, thank you. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. I uh, I think there are probably a few things that I can point to that have influenced the way that I speak. Mm -hmm. A, my mother. My mother is a speech pathologist. So <laughs> nice. I know what that is, that is someone whose profession it is to... Uh, correct how people talk and so from a very young age she would be on top of me talking about articulation and all of that so I think I became aware of the power of one speech at a very young age uh I also grew up watching Felicia Rashad on the Cosby show who is a total icon of mine and I grew up watching uh, Oprah. And I had a very strong reference of Black people who were speaking beautifully. James Earl Jones, Sidney Poitier, um, you know, Denzel Washington. There are Muhammad Ali. There are a lot of African Americans out there who I grew up watching and thinking, okay, yeah, they got it. They'll do. They'll that'll work. <laughs> uh, so I it was laid out before me. It was laid out, and so I think you know my approach to communication sort of standing stands on the shoulders of those people. And then I think as a young gay man, I also recognized the power of speech, right? Because when you are a young gay kid, you are trying to figure out where you fit in the world. You're trying to figure out what is my path forward? Because I recognize that I'm, uh, you know, a unicorn in this situation and, and nobody else really gets it. So I started to get involved in theater at a very young age. I think that I knew that I was like, okay, that's, I need to be over there with those people. Um, maybe it was like nine, eight or nine I was. And then when I was 12, I joined uh, the Detroit, uh, sorry, I Detroit, I joined, oh my gosh. Oh, Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joined that organization, which was incredible i was like oh, these are my people everyone here i'm not the weirdest one here i'm like small potatoes everyone is like has a bigger personality than me everyone is and so you know you learn from your community and so yes. that was a really amazing opportunity to uh find 
my people, find my group, find my tribe. And they helped me to feel safe and being amongst. And today, those are some of my best friends. Today. And that's, yeah. So I met them when I was 12. And today I am uh, 15. So, uh, (laughs) yeah. If, if anyone's asking. Uh, <laughs> no, it's been oh, oh, two decades, more than two decades that I've known these these guys. And they're all doing amazing. Some of them have Emmy nominations, Tony Awards. Like these are kids who really have uh, excelled in in the world. And so I think all of that has helped me to recognize how important it is to... Uh, not leave your voice on the inside and find a way to get it out. So, and I even think that's true of floral design. It's an expression. Mm -hmm. It's it's an absolute expression where I am like, I'm talking to my flowers. The flowers are talking to me and I'm talking through the flowers. Um, Well, at least you're talking to flowers. I talk to myself in my office. (laughs) really do talking to flowers I'll be like okay you know come on now work with me <laughs> in there all right don't break oh please don't break you know I, I, I talk to them I tell them I try to get them to cooperate because it is a cooperative sort of uh relationship that you have they're from nature we're from nature why not work together you know oh I plug him out oh, it's all good I love it I love it so I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about this as a judge and I'm sure Netflix, you know, again, we talked about, I'm sure that's your speaking capabilities is what drew Netflix to you, but how did you come up with what you would say during the show? Was it totally off the cuff? Did you like take notes and like think of different phrases that you could use? How did that work for you? Um, <clears throat> so the show works in two ways and I I can't talk about it so when we're setting the challenge all right so at the beginning we are like you hear me saying I want you to make a big beautiful uh, you know Dixie cup or whatever it is that the Mm -hmm. challenge is they give me head judge a brief um and so prior to us going into production I would be on calls with the production team and I'd be working with them to set the standards, set the challenges for the show. So everything that you see on the show has my input in it. They were probably one of the most amazing teams that I've ever worked with because they were like, you're the judge, you're the expert. What do you want? Nothing was like spoon fed to me. Nothing was, they never told me what I had to say. They never told me who should be going home and who should be. It was all up to me. Um, and so for the, for the challenges, they say, okay, Kristen, the team's got this information, right? Because some of the challenges, the teams knew ahead of time. And okay. then some of them, they don't know ahead of time that's how all competition reality shows work is you know like i think they knew that they were going to have to do a uh which ones did they know i think they knew that they were going to have to do a um a mobile maybe Mm -hmm. i'll say i don't remember which ones but i know that they knew what some of them were ahead of time and then a lot of them were surprises right so we had to get the language very specific for setting Mm -hmm. challenges <clears throat> because it had to be fair. You couldn't tell them ahead of time, you're going to be making, you know, gigantic high heels and then turn around and be like, actually, it's going to be trash cans this week. It's just <laughs> not. <clears throat> it just wouldn't be fair for, the, for those challenges. And then the surprises, obviously, were surprises. Um, so that part is lightly scripted. But for the most part, they were like, they'd give me the script and then I would write in. I'd rewrite it. Right. And then they'd take it over to the network to be like, okay, does this still fit in within the rules? And then the network would come back and say, okay, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but other than that, nothing was, nothing else was scripted. All the judgings, all the interactions that you saw were just like in the moment in real time. I love it. I'm jealous of you officially. Alrighty. <laughs> oh, God. <please. laughs> oh. So, um, 
All right. So a lot of people have been asking me, I see it in the comments. I had an email and then I also wanted to know my girls want to know, and it's a little bit shallow, but we're, I'm obsessed with um, just seeing what you were going to wear in each of the episodes. <laughs> yeah. And, but I, I did. I want to say that I totally Insta stalked you. I scrolled pretty far down and I know, and, and you have, you know, just a, a a shirt on a button up and, and I see you wearing sweaters and t-shirts and like the rest of us, like normal people, <laughs> regular, <laughs> regular clothes. But I want to know what was your process of selecting your fabulous outfits that you chose for, for each of the episodes? How did that go? <laughs> Everyone wants to know. Everyone's curious I about the clothing. I love it. That's, that tends to be like the trend right now, right? The trend is everyone wants to know about my clothing and yes. everyone wants to know about my my name. Everyone's fascinated. You do have me. a very interesting name. My my oldest was like, "What's his name again?" And how do you say it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so funny. Um, yeah. So the clothing for me, it was really just about looking good. Uh, I knew that, and it evolved. It really evolved. So the stylist on the show. Uh, there were two, her name, Tess and Helen. Uh, they were amazing. They were like, what do you want? So I put together like a vision board of what I wanted. And then they brought racks and racks of clothing. And I was like, this one, that one, this one, that one, this one, that one. And, and I think it's a learning curve too. Like you sort of learn what works on your body and you learn right. what you know, doesn't work. Um, and I think that you just sort of figure it out as you go. For that that show, the network definitely was like, you need to look like a judge. You need to mm -hmm. look a, a more official. Because I'm not the kind of person who just puts on a suit. <laughs> right. Every, every day. I think before the show, I owned probably six or seven suits that I would wear to weddings. Like I dress up for weddings for events and things, but it, you know, I wasn't that kind of a person. But you can, you can wear a suit. You just don't wear <laughs> yeah. it. Like it, yeah. you look amazing in those suits and everything fits so lovely. And so if I were you, I'd be wearing yeah. suits all the time. Cause you no, know, why not? No, I, do know my <laughs> I do know my body. I do know my body. And I think that, you know, I, I grew up swimming, so I have very broad shoulders, which mm -hmm. I think gives the illusion that I have a tiny waist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to remember, television is, is a lot of smoke and mirrors, too. Like, there, there are some days where I, like, I'm cinched in, like, sewed in to some of those. <laughs> oh, outfits. no. <laughs> yeah, because they have to... So, technically, you can't have a lot of slack in your outfits because right. of where they put the microphone because you'll hear the ah yes so for a lot of those it's like they've taken my shirt and they have like clamped it in the back it's like skin 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 tight so like most of the time I couldn't even breathe in those things <laughs> but I was like anything for fashion anything <laughs> for fashion um and yeah, it was great. They were really supportive. And I'm hoping it, that we get a season two so we can, you know, take it even further. Because I do love fashion. And it actually is a great segue into creativity. Um, one of my influences is fashion. Is I grew up reading. Oh, hi, sweetie. Yeah, I knew he was going to barge in at some Come point. He always girl. comes in. Yeah. Um, I, I grew up reading, you know, Essence Magazine. And I grew up reading Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And before I was a florist, I was, there was a period in my life where I was like, am I going to go into fashion? Am I going to go into, into design and, or merchandising or being a buyer? I just knew that I wanted to be involved. And so a lot of the work that I do, I, I, I like to say that I design from an editorial lens. That's one of the influences that's on my you know, floral design. I want to be super dramatic and graphic and beautiful at the same time. So I think that as creatives, don't just look within your industry 
for inspiration. Look outside yeah. of your inspiration, uh, outside of our industry for inspiration. It could be a ladybug that inspires, you know, a beautiful black and white arrangement. It could be a black and red arrangement. Um, it could be anything. It could be a song. You know, I've been inspired by, you know, music all the time. Uh, yep. So our influences come from a lot of places. I love it. Uh, Penny wants to know, do you have a favorite suit? Do, from the show? Yeah. Um, the suit that I, that I really felt amazing in was the Kelly Green tweed suit. Yes. The green tweed suit, which is from episode five, is probably my favorite one, followed by the velvet floral suit from episode eight. That's my favorite. Yeah, I loved the velvet floral suit from episode eight. It wasn't <clears throat> it wasn't the most comfortable to wear because the velvet clinged <laughs> to my legs. Oh. A lot. Yeah, it clings to my legs a lot. So I ended up having to wear like an entire bodysuit underneath that. So underneath the turtleneck and the suit is I'm wearing <laughs> a, I'm wearing oh a God. neck to ankle bodysuit wow. because the static cling of that suit was intense. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. See, total behind the scenes. You know, <laughs> and you guys aren't gonna learn this in any other interview. <laughs> <laughs> I it's love all it. smoke and mirrors tv is all smoke and mirrors like how people look it's all like i had an entire glam squad off camera <clears throat> who was there touching me up and making my hair look good and putting chapstick on and that take care of you it's all smoke and mirrors really i love it i love it <laughs> We're, we're running out of time, guys. Let's uh -oh. see. <clears throat> I know. We're getting we're getting down to that hour. So I wanted to know, it's disregarding the final challenge, and if anyone hasn't watched it, I won't bring it up, um, but who was your overall favorite design team? Was it the team that won, or was there maybe another team that you thought, like, that was one of your favorites? I think that all of the teams there uh, were pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be hard for me to choose one team. Obviously, the team that won is amazing and talented. Yep. And, you know, I was completely blown away by their work. Uh, but that doesn't discount the work of the other teams. And I like to really look at the show as um, a learning opportunity. Like, I still am learning. And mm -hmm. people never hear me say that, you know, I have arrived because if I have, then, you know, then I need to find a new job uh, because we always need to continue to learn. So I really valued the teams in what I was able to steal from them after the show. Uh, teams like Jim and Ralph, whose knowledge of coastal plants is mm -hmm. so advanced and so superior. And their knowledge of just sort of like planting in general is that's the dad and lad team. If you don't know who that yes. is, my baby. They're so they're um, so cute. And Chanel and Raymond, who showed me a completely new technique for doing floral fashion, right? Mm -hmm. the technique that they use, which you don't see on the show, which is so crazy, is they created tubing, tubing out of netting and chicken mm -hmm. wire, and they fill that tubing with moss. And then they added in all of their flowers. And then, mind you, it had to be on a model. So they had to back the tubing, this giant tubings that made that helix, they had to back that tubing with a softer fabric. They used, I think it was like maybe neoprene that they used. And they did all of this in 15 hours. Yeah, it was amazing. I could I could barely get ready for this podcast in an hour. And I'm both, I mean, and I'm really just hair. Come on, like how? So, you know, all the teams were inventing new techniques for uh, the show. And Jan and Hank, the amount of work that they were able to do in episode three—if you haven't seen it, 
Just go find out what the orangutan is because I love the orangutan. Maybe they, the things that they did. So I think that all the teams really uh, blew my mind and showed me how wild and how incredible your imagination can be if you just give yourself permission. And that's what it's all about. It's about giving yourself permission to take the risk. Um, because even if you fall flat on your face, I'd rather you do that than not. And play it safe because playing it safe means what? You're going home. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, you bringing up the orangutan, which reminds me when I had Sarah and Jordan on, I, I was telling them that my girls loved the chubby lemur. Uh, they uh, were uh, the puppy lemur. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so she wanted me to make sure I brought that up right. in today's interview to let you know that we did ah. love the lemur. Yeah, I loved the lemur too. I think that, you know, on that show, especially what you see on the show, uh, is always sort of somebody has to go home. Right. And when everyone is amazing, which everyone on that show was amazing, there really were no duds going on right yeah, I agree. um when you're on a show where the talent is so extreme and so exceptional you have to nitpick and you have to get down to details that otherwise would go over and you know in that challenge it was the criteria was like show me your cutting skills too and so we you know we had to like go in on that but and it's always interesting what the editors choose to put in the show too, because you, you know, there's tons of positives, but I also love that lemur and think it was amazing. And what was so cute is, I don't know if we see on the show, but Sarah put in, I don't know if she kept it, but at some point in the show, in her process, she put in braids in the front. I think you maybe see her braiding the hair, putting in plaits and I thought that was such a cute touch to give that lemur personality, yeah. you know, like they're just so talented, those two. Yeah. Yeah. Talented and, and fun and, and kind. And everyone seemed just really genuinely amazing people. Like someone asked, were there any real divas on the show? And I feel like if I had to guess, I would say no, but, but people want to know, were there any, any divas? Cause everyone just seemed like just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I love it. Say, no, but I really will say that everyone was incredible. And if I'm being 100% honest, I did not get to know the contestants beyond what you see on the show. I was very strict with myself and very... Um, uh, calculated about the amount of time that I spent with each contestant. So if the cameras weren't rolling, I made a professional and personal choice to not be talking to them. So you could keep it fair and unbiased. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, you know, and I think you know this from interviewing when you want to get the good stuff on camera, you know, right. if we're talking, how authentic is it going to be when the cameras are rolling? If we just talked about it, five minutes ago. So from a, a, giving myself an uh, opportunity to be really authentic on camera, I had to really, you know, uh, section myself off from them. But once the contestants were kicked off of the show, once they were like eliminated, then I was like, okay, hi. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. I could let down some of those walls that you sort of have to put up as a judge. So, right. you know, as much as people want the inside dish, I didn't see any of the drama. And if I did see the drama, you probably see me commenting on it on the show. Uh, right. Just because, right. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Aaron sent in another great question. I think um, that'll be good to answer. She said, what advice do you have for florists that are looking to create large pieces like seen on the show? Find a welder. It, I know. I told Sarah and Jordan, like, you need to go to, like, you know, carpentry classes before you do anything. 
find a welder. I think that every well, single florist knows that the secret to a successful design is your engineering. Yeah. It's your, whether you are doing a tape grid, whether you are doing, uh, you know, chicken wire, whether you're doing whatever your techniques are, um, it's all about your engineering. So find yourself a welder, find yourself a carpenter, and then, you know, work with them because that's what is behind every single one of those structures is yes. an entire art department that is welding all of those things for them. The, and I'm talking about the, the inside, the steel cages. Mm-hmm. That they're using. Cause there's no way. I mean, if you want to be brave and carve that out of foam and <laughs> sit there and tape it, good luck, more power to you. Yeah, you can um, you can watch an episode when it doesn't work so well when you're just kind of yeah. rigging things together. That... Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I think that's episode six. Yes. Um, yeah. So I would say find get get your team. Find your find your team. Find your um your people. Your your craftsmen. And it's yes. great because then we get to employ more small business. Exactly. I love it. I love it. I do. It's, it's, you know, a little bit after 12, we've been on Whoa! for 61 minutes already. Kristen, is there any last parting message that you want to leave the show with? Yeah. I would love to just tell every single person. I'm going to look right into the camera. I would love to tell every single person who's watching. Thank you so much for um, all of your beautiful messages and the love that you have given me. I've gotten hundreds and I'm talking hundreds of emails and private messages on Instagram and people writing to me and leaving comments. And I want to thank you so much because I never ever imagined that I would have a platform to be myself. I was always the weird kid. I was always the kid who was told you're too loud. You're too extra. You're too much. And so to be embraced so beautifully and so wholeheartedly by the floral community and everyone else out there who's new to this face, um, thank you so much. And if you are a little black kid or a little brown kid, I'm going to talk directly to you and say that you can really change the world. And what's inside of you is something special and something beautiful and give yourself permission to try. You're going to fail because when you are in the arena of life and you are in the arena of doing something great, there are going to be failures. There are going to be people throwing rocks, but just stick with it. Stick with yourself and give yourself permission to try. And I guarantee you, you will be successful and you will find your way. And I love you all. Thank you so much. Oh, I love you too, Kristen. You're amazing. Really, oh. truly, truly, truly amazing. Thank you. Um, I added the your Instagram to the screen. It's also in the comments, guys. If you haven't already connected with Kristen, please do. Um, please follow him. Support him. He's amazing. There are people that want to know, how do we make sure that season two happens? How, do, how can we make sure that okay, happens? And we so- see you as judge again. Yeah, so um, I think the best way is to blow up Netflix, (laughs) blow them up. Like, I'm not talking like physically blow them up, like tag Netflix in anytime you have something nice to say, hashtag Netflix, hashtag the big flower fight. Uh, Netflix wants to know that our show is affecting the community and they love word of mouth and they love buzz. And I don't know if that's a secret. Sorry if it is, but um, it, it, that's, that's how they look at it. Uh, yep. but like I said, these platforms view value time. They value your time. They value your attention. So rewatch the big flower fight, watch it, share it with your family, share your Netflix password and say, girl, you got to watch this show. Uh, yep. Like they really look at viewing hours. Um, on the show. So really like let the, let Netflix know you want a second season. Yeah. That's the best way. 
I love it. I I just uh, filled out the Rotten Tomatoes, like, you know, rating. Um, And yeah, and it is a really great family show. My little ones loved it. I loved it. My my husband, he watched it. He really liked it too. He always falls asleep though, because he has to get up so early. So he sees like, he's seen like half of every episode. Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He he can't stay awake, but it's all good. That's a whole other issue. Yeah, it's all right. But yeah, it's an amazing show. I think you did a lovely, fantastic job, Kristen, with it. Um, I'm so I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that we got to meet and do this show. And thank you so much for coming on. I love it. Yay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for honestly taking this moment and continuing the momentum. Um, I, oh, I just want to say one more thing. One more thing yep. before we go. Of course. Um, I want everyone right now, after you leave this, to go onto Instagram, go on your social media, and there's three accounts that I need you to follow. Okay. A grassroots law, grassroots law. They are an organization that is working tirelessly to make sure that the killings and murderings of black and brown people are taken to the law that justice is being served. So if you want to get involved and really make sure that justice is being served, grassroots law and then also go follow sean king s-h-a-u-n-k-i-n-g sean king he is really um out there shedding a light and telling the truth on uh everything that's happening will you spell that one more time s-h-a-u-n-k-i-n-g let me okay i got it got it i got him Um, yeah I'm going to post it. I'm posting all this in the comments while you're yeah. talking. And and honestly, a lot of what's happened, a lot of the information and the video evidence that's come out has come out because an advocate like Sean King has been putting it out there. And also go to the Obama.org. Obama.org. He has an entire list of organizations out there that are working together to create sensible laws to make sure that we are all safe. Sensible laws. There are bills that he's put forward. There's so much stuff out there and so much information, Obama.org. And just, you know, do your research and educate yourself. And thank you. I know it's uncomfortable. I know that it is uncomfortable. I know that this moment feels like, ah, everyone's telling me that, you know, if, if I'm a white person, that I'm bad. And I guarantee that is not the case. It is not black versus white. It is everyone versus racist. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone for hanging in with us and just tuning in. I feel like this was definitely one of the more important episodes that we've ever had. And again, Yay. thank you, Kristen, for coming and doing this with us. Um, and everyone for your support. Stay tuned for our next show. Thank Obviously, you. if you have questions, send them in and uh, stay safe and stay healthy, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.